today's good or bad use of polling was actually suggested by you, Nate. So a recent YouGov poll asked Americans, how concerned, if at all, are you about the possibility that AI will cause the end of the human race on Earth? 19% said very concerned. 27% said somewhat concerned. 23% said not very concerned. And 17% said not concerned at all. Another 13% weren't sure. I know that's a lot of numbers, so let me be a little more concise here. 46% of Americans said they were at least somewhat concerned that AI will cause the end of the human race on Earth. Okay. Nate, is that a good or bad use of polling? I think it's a polling result that one should not take terribly literally. Um, people like to be agreeable and respond to questions when you ask them questions. Uh it's kind of like chat GPT in that way, ironically. Um, and so if, if you suggest something in the frame of the question, you say, okay, um, are you concerned that like, let's say, are you concerned that like solar flares and solar radiation, expanding solar radiation could cause like the end of life on earth, right? You might say, I don't really know a lot about that, but like. Sounds like I it. I <laughs> guess that sounds smart. So I'm going to say yes, because you suggested this as a poll, you gov. Um, but the so I mean let me back up right the background for this is that there are a there are communities of people people in the tech community people in the community called effective altruism or rationalism that have for really quite a while um, been concerned that super intelligent artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence AGI is a term that's sometimes used um, poses existential risks to uh, to uh, to humanity right. The classic version of this argument is that um, imagine that you had, this is from Nick Bostrom, who is a Swedish philosopher at Oxford. Um, imagine you have a machine. Mm, pulling out the Oxford philosophers <laughs> this morning. Well, but they're a big part of this movement. Um, it's Oxford and the Bay Area, basically. Um, imagine you have a machine that's like very, very intelligent and also is set to maximize the goal of making as many paper clips as possible, Right. So it basically destroys all of humanity to turn people into paper clips and fulfill its mission. Is this credible or not, right? Um, when you first hear it, you you might think not. Uh, then there are also people who think that AI is dangerous because it can cause humans to do bad things to other humans, right? There was like a report last week, I think, of like an AI chatbot that like encouraged someone to commit um, suicide, right? But you can imagine different schemes and scams and different ways to enhance blending dangerous chemicals together or things like that, um, or biomedical problems that AI would aid and abet. So there are different scenarios people are worried about. And in that community, it um, has been a mainstream position that like this is something to be to be worried about. This has not been something that we've been talked about very much uh, in kind of mainstream political discourse. But oh, last week or two weeks ago, a Time magazine article by Elizier Yudkowsky, who is an AI researcher and one of the most doom centric, right? Like he thinks there's a good chance we're all going to die, right? He wrote this op-ed in Time, which um, is still widely read um, and kind of said, this is really bad. And we should think about like, do we need to potentially take military action against like data centers that are doing these training runs on models? So like that kind of thrust the debate into the mainstream. There was a question for President Biden about it in a press briefing. And most people have no idea what they're talking about, right? This has been something debated in one community for years. All of a sudden, it's a new debate, a new community. People don't have priors on it. And so, so yeah, that's a very long-winded version of where we are. But how many people have seen Terminator or any of its you know, sequels, right? <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, Wait, no, okay, so first, it's all you need. I want to stand corrected. Um, this is not a lighter segment. This segment may actually address the end of humanity. But Nate, I like no, it's not so it's understanding not a, like, the context that you it's more important, even if you're like oh. not like a doomer, it's more important than 95% of the stuff we talk about in politics from day to day, right? It's you know a fairly high stakes debate, and like people aren't good at like like we should be debating more about like pandemic preparedness and why aren't we investing in preventing the next COVID-19, right? That's a really high stakes issue or we can talk about climate change and things like that or nuclear war, right? For better or worse, this kind of community of like rationalists, I think, are good at like identifying which issues substantively matter matter more. 
And things involving so existential risk matter a lot. I am not sure, though, after everything you've said, whether or not this is a good use or bad use of plunk. Because at first I thought it was bad, but then you seem to cite a lot of evidence that it's actually a good use of polling. It's a good, well, I don't know. I mean, you probably know about what I think about what happens when issues get politicized. And we'll talk about the age of Congress in a moment. You know, um, I, you know, I am not sure it's going to be good for the AI debate to have this be more mainstream um, and to have like regular Joe MSNBC and Fox News and CNN watchers have opinions about AI policy that probably eventually get tied to like partisan frames around the issue. Like, I think that'll make the debate much stupider. Um, but what if it turns into an issue like China, where there's a competition between the two parties to seem more hawkish on it? Because that doesn't seem like totally out of the realm of possibility right now. Like when I hear politicians talk about this, there appears to be concerns on both sides of the aisle and, you know, Republicans, I would say, like, Democrats are worried about, like, civil rights issues and, you know, AI, like, all in all different kinds of ways. Republicans are like, well, this could replace everyone's jobs. Or if you don't like NAFTA or if you don't like free trade with China, like, get ready for AI. You know what I mean? Like, there are reasons to believe that there could actually be a race to hawkishness. Right. I look, I mean, look, there are lots of angles why people might be like, I think in the long run, AI will be subject to a lot of cross pressures for a lot of reasons, right? There's also the whole, like, there are people who think the AI bots are too woke. There are people who think they're not woke enough, right? Um, there are issues over copyright. If it's just mining all the text and all human output, right? Then like that creates some pretty big copyright issues potentially if you're kind of regurgitating something that like I wrote or, or someone else wrote, you know, uh, decades ago. Um, so it's going to be, but like, look, this is going to be a major policy debate for, the rest of our lives, right? Um, even if you're not particularly um, an accelerationist or a doomer or these different names, right? This is still probably a technology lower bound is, you know, as important as as the internet probably, right? Maybe not lower bound, but like reasonable bound, right? And that's going to affect our lives um, profoundly in, in lots of ways. So the AI regulation debate is here to stay. Okay. So it sounds like directionally you're supportive of this poll and this is the last time I'm going to harp on whether or not it's a good or bad use of polling because I understand that the issue is larger than that. But I do want to give Jeff and Kaylee the opportunity to weigh in on how they view this this use of polling as well. Well, I mean, I agree with Nate on the the significance of this debate in general. And this has been, I can't tell you, like an ongoing discussion in my household for a couple of weeks. Um, but this particular polling, this question, the way it was framed, I, I don't know if it's particularly useful. I think it raises a bit of fear mongering among a, a a pool of respondents who maybe aren't super. I, I don't know that they've read all the Oxford philosophers on this subject. I certainly haven't. So, uh, in that view, I think feel like it's a bad. Use sounds of like polling. if they did, though, they would have been even more in favor. Of Possibly, it yeah. It sounds like <laughs> from Nate's synopsis. I don't know. I worry a lot about. Uh, I feel like there's a tendency towards technophobia and just assuming that if there are any negative consequences to a technological advancement, then that negates all of the positive implications of it. And there's also, you know, a, a limit to, I, I think that obviously this policy question is going to continue to be one. I think it certainly should be one. I don't think that there was enough discussion around policy and regulation with the internet and there continues to be issues because of that fallout from that. And so I think talking about it early is smart. Uh, this is going to advance much more quickly than the internet ever was able to. And there are going to be economic, political, social implications of it. Uh, that said, I, you know, there's also the kind of a, a bit of you can't stop the march of progress. So it's I don't know. It's complex. But I don't know that this question does a lot of good. It might even make the issue seem more silly, actually, mm, um, if you're trying to focus people's attention on the seriousness of the issue, having the opening salvo be, do you think this is going to end humanity? 
might just make people giggle. Right. Yeah. Like, is ChatGPT going to kill us all tomorrow? No. Um, is it going to drastically impact our economy and our, you know, pe- are people going to potentially lose their jobs because of this? Probably yes. And, and how do we want to manage that? And how do we want to respond to that? But that's not as fun of a question, I guess. <laughs> I guess my answer depends on whether you think we live in a simulation or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Really getting better there. Uh, it's a bad use of polling if if you think we actually have like free will and you know we we are just responding to uh, you know the sort of the concern setup of the of the question, and so it's not really telling us much of anything. Um, and, and then it's just NA if we live in a simulation because who cares? Uh, so I, 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 I'm obviously kidding, um, but I do have you know multiple text friends, text threads with friends about the Fermi paradox going, and uh, questions like that. So you know the the future of AI is obviously uh, uh, very interesting, maybe a little scary, uh, but uh, yeah. On the on the on the polling question, I'm going to go with bad use in terms of it really telling us anything. So there are two more serious politics, public opinion topics that I want to talk about, which is one, what is a good gauge of how people are thinking about this? And are people aware of the issues in proportion to its severity? And then two, which is related, why hasn't AI really been regulated, at least federally, yet? Um, So maybe let's talk about the first one first. To the extent that this is a political issue, how aware are Americans of it, Nate? Uh, not very. So the one poll I'm fond of looking at for a lot of reasons is like there was just a ongoing for many years Gallup poll that asked people open-ended question without any prompts. What's the most important issue facing the country today, right? And given how many issues there are to even get to like you know, 2% or 4% in that poll is a lot, right? Like things like climate change or crime or um, or abortion, right? Might get to like 2 3 4%. Um, currently, the category for AI, which is like progressive technology slash computers or something, is at like asterisk or 0%, right? So some tiny fraction of people list it as the most important issue. Um, when, if, <laughs> when or if does this issue become mainstream enough that like, Two percent of people say it's the most important issue that I'm worried about or voting on. I mean, I would track that number, right? When does that get into the non asterisk territory for a sense of like this is now one of the top dozen or so or fifteen issues that get debated in in politics? And so, are in a way, is public interest to blame for the lack of regulation, or is it something else? I mean, Congress has historically never been very good at regulating technology. It, it, there's a, a a bit of a gap of, of knowledge in some cases, not always. Um, there's also, yeah, I think a, a lack. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things to, to legislate on right now and a lot of things that voters are more interested in that it's hard to prioritize this. Um and it's it is complicated. Also, you know, technology is evolving constantly. Something that you you know, like Section two hundred and thirty that you write at the dawn of the internet, maybe kind of makes sense then. You know, now there's problems with it that we couldn't really anticipate before. And uh, there's yeah, it's it's challenging to do. It's complicated. It requires a lot of understanding and knowledge. And there's not a lot of a lot of political appetite for it. So it's not a great combination to get robust technological regulations in place. Yeah, I think one issue too is that like, it's not as though people in Silicon Valley or the tech sector agree on what should be done anyway, right? Um, Like notwithstanding that like, that's a community that might have some trouble with political buy-in anyway, but it's like not like you could go to like the hundred foremost experts on this issue and get a clear consensus about like, A, what the threats are and B, what should be done about them? Because there are arguments about, well, if we pause, then doesn't that help China? On the other hand, you might have existing players. You know, Microsoft might not mind if you regulate people, other people from developing AI. If you uh, regulate them, they wouldn't like it very much at all. Um, but there aren't like natural partisan coalitions on the issue yet. Um, 
And the average member of Congress is a dinosaur when it comes to tech issues. Their staff might be slightly better, but um, because it is so off the radar screen, they're not hearing from their constituents as much. And so there's not much, there's not much guidance. If you are like, honestly, if you are someone who like um, is an expert, it probably is time to weigh in because the conventional wisdom is still is still forming on this issue. Yeah, I should say that part of the reason we're talking about this is because a bunch of tech leaders, including Elon Musk, called for a pause on the development of AI beyond GPT-4. So here's a quote from a letter that they all signed as part of the Future of Life Institute. We call on all AI labs to immediately pause for at least six months the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. They go on to say, advanced AI could represent a profound change in the history of life on Earth and should be planned for and managed with commensurate care and resources. Unfortunately, this level of planning and management is not happening, even though recent months have seen AI labs locked in an out-of-control race to develop and deploy ever more powerful digital minds that no one, not even their creators, can understand, predict, or reliably control. So it sounds like there's no consensus. Like, that letter didn't say, this is what we think should happen. It just said, we don't have an answer, so at least we need to hit pause for right. I'm sorry. Right Elon now. Musk is asking you to pause AI because he doesn't currently own any AI companies. Like, <laughs> give me right. six well, that's, months. That's, that, appears to be, that appears to be part of what Nate is saying is that, you know, it's, it's for the interested parties, they all have competing is, interests. Is this like the exactly. Donald Trump um, thing of like, and we so just perhaps, need to pause and just figure out what the hell is going on here? Yeah. We need to yeah. figure out what yeah. the hell is going on. Yeah. I mean, Nate, is it clear what the options are if politicians did decide to, it was time to regulate? I don't know. I mean, I think, look, you could try to treat it like a technology like nuclear weapons or something, right? Where there's strict regulation of the materials that you would need to build a GPU that could do one of these massive training runs, right? There are sanctions, if not military activity, if people do it kind of in violation of, of prescribed agreements. Um, and you'll hear different things about like how much can you kind of do this in your in your basement versus not. So to, to do a training run where you um, test the whole corpus of data, um, like GPT-4 as the latest version, that can take a long time. That's a significant act that like not everyone can do. And it might be a little bit hard to, um, to do without it being detectable. Um, but what if Russia wants to do that, right? What if China wants to do that? Do we really have any ability to regulate that at all? Well, um, again, the analogy is probably to, to nuclear weapons. Um, however, unlike nuclear weapons, um, which don't have a lot of utility apart from killing everybody or deterring you, other people from killing you, right? These tools will have a lot of utility. Uh, people will find them interesting and enjoyable, right? As they get better, they will seem less in the uncanny valley and more um, enjoyable and helpful and efficient in, in different things, right? Um, and so that's that's the other side of it too, is like, and also the people who have like very high upside cases, like this is gonna like make us um, realize the singularity and stuff like that, right? So the people can say it's high stakes either way. And so it's gonna get, I think, pretty, pretty complicated. Um, but clearly like the, you know, major players in Silicon Valley are in a arms race, use that analogy somewhat literally, where Google's like, well, okay, Microsoft has been very aggressive and OpenAI has been very aggressive, so we have to as well, right? Um, so, you know, it's kind of, I'll put it like this. If there's no regulation taken, then you're going to have an arms race. It'll develop, I think, as fast as, you know, capitalism would would allow it, basically, Right. Yeah, I mean, one of the roadblocks that you mentioned, Nate, to regulation is, um, I don't know how else to put this, but like, uh, who is in Congress and their relationship to these kinds of technologies? Somewhat related to this, Jeffrey, you recently looked into why our current Congress is the oldest in history. Um, and that is a topic that comes up a lot in discussion where when they have congressional hearings on technology, I think. You know, of course, Mark Zuckerberg going to testify to Congress created a lot of viral videos. It happens every so often. What did you find? Yeah. So as you said, um, Congress today is older than ever. Um, the median member of the U.S. Senate is 65. The median member of the House is 58. Uh, up until about 2000, uh, the median senator had never gotten above 60 and the median House member had not gotten above 50. 
Uh, so, you know, today, over the last 20 years or so, uh, Congress has gotten notably older. Now, a lot of that has to do with just like the overall aging population. So uh, the U.S. as a whole has gotten older. Uh, and so like the median age now of the entire population is like 38, 39. Um, and the median age of people who would be eligible to even get elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, so you have to be at least 25 to get elected to the House, at least 30 to get elected to the Senate, uh, is is actually now just north of 50. Um, so, you know, there's just sort of there, – there's something going on. It's just like the broader trends in, in population. Um, but at the same time, like in a world where we still have – a, a large number of younger people, um, you do get a situation where you have an older Congress trying to deal with questions about technology. Um, and we saw that actually in the TikTok uh, hearings um, from from uh, March. And there was just kind of a funny thing where uh, Vox noted this, that there were three three different times where a member accidentally said tic-tac when talking about TikTok. And that was just sort of a, you know, it was just sort of an amusing example. We've, we've heard of them before. Ted Stevens back in the, the mid 2000s saying, uh, you know, the internet is a series of tubes, um, sort of, you know, the, 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 the tendency for older members to maybe not be as uh, aware or familiar with, with technology that's sort of become popular uh, among maybe the population as a whole and particularly people who are on the younger side. And so uh, sort of understanding that is, is a, is a big thing. And um, I, I can obviously talk further uh, about the makeup of Congress, but that that's sort of like the broad takeaway. Yeah. I should say these things are, are related and I wanted to include it because you recently wrote a very interesting piece about this. That's like interesting in its own right, separate from the technology question. And folk, there are really interesting charts and folks should go check it out on 538.com. I should also say, obviously old people use technology, young people use technology, middle-aged people use technology. And a lot of the tech companies that are going to be developing this technology are run by people who are probably the same age as Congress. So it's probably also an issue of expertise in general. Like a lot of people who end up in Congress go to law school, but a lot of them don't necessarily study computer right. science. And, and actually, you know, that's one of the things it's like, I don't want to be too like ageist here talking about Congress being older because it's, yeah. it's not just simply down to that. It's also, you know, members of Congress having sort of the right support staff, like at the end of the day. Members of Congress are only going to be experts on a handful of things, you know, things that they have a background in or some sort of significant interest in that they have developed an expertise in. So on most issues, they're not going to be like area experts. It's just not possible. Um, so what they have is they have support staff and they have uh, support staff either that's in their own office or there are uh, different offices on Capitol Hill that are devoted to certain topics that will will share, you know, a member of Congress will say, hey, can you give me, uh, uh, you know, a, the rundown on this particular issue? And like the Congress Congressional Research Service will write up a, a study for them and send it their way, for example. Um, and one of the little things that I noticed while or noted and, and found while I was doing research on this was that Congress used to actually have uh, a, a, a what was called an Office of Technology Assessment um, and it was defunded in 1995 and so it has ceased to exist and there's been occasional conversations about bringing it back. But it was actually devoted to uh, sort of research and, and aiding off uh, uh, members of Congress with information about science and technology. And that doesn't exist anymore. And you wonder in our you know, fast changing, technologically, you know, fast moving world, if, if having you know, something devoted – more specifically to it would be would be like a helpful thing to have. And that was just sort of an example of like ways that, you know, we can't expect members of Congress to, to know everything, but we also would hopefully give them the tools to, to better understand what they're dealing with. I mean, look, also, um, if you have tech friendly skills, right, um, you're very employable, right? It tends to, therefore, like, attract a different type of person, the person that goes into politics, I think, for a living. All and those also, people who majored in English just running our country. <laughs> no, History, sorry, political like, science. Look, if you look uh, at like... Ouch. Philosophy. No, look at ouch. financial rewards. I'm one right? of them. Don't worry. Don't send me emails. I get it. I studied international yeah, studies. I was a history major. I'm just an undergrad. <laughs> no, but like as it... The STEM major. professions become more and more employable every year and the humanities professions do not. That's just a fact. Uh... And also Silicon Valley has always been kind of looked at Washington, D.C. as uh, as beneath it, sort of, right? That these people don't really understand capitalism and risk and technology and 
and we do, and so move fast and break things um, instead of asking for regulation, right? So the relationships aren't aren't really strong, um, and I think the tech world's also kind of uh, not quite been able to deal with kind of being seen as um, kind of the heel turn in public perception among at least kind of progressive elites toward the tech sector. That's happened, I think, within a few, maybe a half decade or so. And I think people are still concerned about like massaging their ego and things like that. So for various reasons, it's like a little bit of oil and water, these two parts of the world trying to interact. Not just progressive. Big tech has become popular to hate on all sides. Yeah. Everybody hates yeah. them. It's interesting. I mean, obviously, it's popular to also bash the financial sector, although it is highly regulated. And the relationship between New York and Washington, D.C. is much closer, I would say. But also financial regulation is in large part the product of a series of crises over hundreds of years. So Get ready. <laughs> maybe that's just what's going to happen. Well, you know, it's like they're the new trusts. You know, it's like trust busting in the you know late 19th, early 20th century. It's like you have these giant technology companies that have, you know, just massive market capitalizations and are have their tentacles and all sorts of things. And it's, you, you know, you get the real big business vibe. Uh, so, you know, that it, it, there is maybe historical precedent, you know, for something that's this important and has this much influence on, on society, um, getting, getting a harder look, uh, from, from Congress and from politicians. We'll see. Anyone have a, anyone have a parting thought on, AI, the future of humanity, the competency of lawmakers, the relationship between New York and Washington, D.C., uh, or Gun Poland. control, uh, abortion. <laughs> Gun control, Mifepristone. <laughs> Covered a lot here. <laughs> I will say that I think humanity is going to cause the end of humanity long before any of our tech gets there. We're on track. Ooh. Savage. It's a, Savage. It's a really dark note to end on. But also, I mean, humanity created AI. So even if AI did I'm it, right it's no matter humanity. what. <laughs> yeah. Um, Nate, are you, let me, let me, add, this is my final question. Participants in this podcast, are you either very concerned, somewhat concerned, not very concerned, not concerned, or not sure with regards to the question, how concerned, if at all, are you that? about the possibility that AI will cause the end of the human race on Earth. Not very. Some, somewhat Not concerned. Very. Somewhat I would concerned. probably go with somewhat because, like, concerned. Somewhat concerned. Like, what if it's a 5% chance, right? That's very concerned. Do you think it's a 5% chance? Sure. And where does 5% come from? <laughs> uh, looking at surveys of um, experts in this issue, that's probably somewhere where you get in the low, or excuse me, the Mid to high single digits, I think, is probably the consensus estimate, if not a little bit higher. Um, of that five percent, what's the percent chance that we all turn into paper end up being made into paper clips? I mean, with like Kaylee, I'm more worried that like so. To me, the scenario is: will AI turn us all into paper clips? I mean, maybe, but that's not where the five percent <laughs> would come from. It's like: will these tools cause humans to do other things? Uh, to other humans more easily and more effectively, right? Um, that's a concern. Also, there's shit where like things just get really weird, right? Um, if you kind of carry the science fiction narrative all the way forward, and now you have some other intelligence that like is more intelligent than we are, well, what if you lose like a lot of freedom, right? What if it tries to engineer your life, kind of treat humans as like pets or something like that, right? Um, you know, that's not necessarily great either. Um, or what if, what if we are so afraid of AI justifiably or not that we like destroy lots of technology and we kind of go back to the stone ages and like destroy the internet and things like That's that. Dune. Right. You know, yeah. so there are lots of, there are lots of scenarios. Yeah, no, I mean, the Butlerian jihad, know, guys. I guess brush up on your science you fiction. Know? I don't know this paperclip thing just has me picturing like a sci-fi horror clippy. <laughs> clippy. <laughs> <Evil> clippy. <laughs> We're all clippy. <laughs> I, I see mean, you're trying to kill me. Microsoft Bing and Clippy will kill us all in the end. <laughs> um, I think you have to say like allegedly or something so you don't get sued, Nate. <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> Clippy. Yeah, cover your, always good to cover your bases. Don't allegedly, break Clippy. Clippy's wrath. <laughs> or kill my Clippy. <laughs> uh, see, it's hard to both take this seriously 
and not have fun with it at the same time because it does all seem like kind of crazy. You, right? you have again these communities are like like effective altruists and rationalists and AI researchers. It's like a very small eccentric esoteric group that like punches above its weight as far as having like buy buy in from like academics like tech moguls and people in the media I guess like me. Um, so like, but I think they're not used to like how ridiculous this contention will sound to the average person. Um, and does that mean that it is ridiculous? I, I, I don't quite think that, right. But like, it's going to be like a lot of translating that has to be done because, um, because it hasn't kind of bridged this chasm that it's now bridging very fast into like mainstream political discourse, which, you know, even non weird debates become stupid when they get touched upon by partisans and stuff like that. Right. And so, um, yeah. you have know a weird reminds debate. Me of, uh, Nate, the, there's a coalition, like a campaign to stop killer robots. And whenever I mention that to somebody, they kind of like snicker and think that's very funny and think of Terminator. But is another discussion that we should be having as a society as robotics continues to advance and naturally, you know, we see military applications for them. We need to discuss whether that's a path we want to go down and if not, how we want to regulate it. So, you know, it's... Yeah, you know, I'll see some video. I'll see some video on Twitter of like some robot doing some like kind of incredible gymnastic or throwing thing. And I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> they really are advancing well, quite rapidly. <laughs> to bring this back down to like political science for a second, uh, Nate, you sort of said, you know, we don't spend enough time talking about these things that are so essential to the future of humanity that are more important than dumb that gets a lot of airtime on cable news or in the media in general or whatever. Like, according to political science, the best way to sort of move legislation through the system is to not have a spotlight on it and to not have it become partisan. Like, it sounds anti-democratic in a way, and I understand those those critiques of that sort of philosophy, but part of one of the reasons among many, many that bipartisanship has become more difficult is that every aspect of the sausage making prospect process has sort of like the bright lights of the media focused on it. And so politicians can't sort of talk to each other outside of the limelight, have those relationships, be a little more like sincere, earnest, and not so showy and hash out you know, how to actually make the sausage. Um, because once everything becomes politicized and once like this one little piece uh, or polarized, this one little piece of the conversation gets played a million times on talk radio or cable news, then everything blows up and falls apart. And so if the goal is to have sort of responsible regulation of AI, is there an argument that like, it's place, it, it should not happen in the in the sort of like partisan media spotlight? I mean, in principle, if you had an industry consensus, here's how we would like to be regulated, um, then although it's a little bit anti-democratic to have all these rules written without public input from a utilitarian standpoint, that might be good. But there is no consensus, mm -hmm. and also the industry is self-interested in, in different ways, right? What's best for Google and Microsoft might not be best for the country as a whole. Um, yeah. So the default is that things are not being regulated very much. Um, and I think my perspective is that you'll probably have some incidents that scare people that cause things to be regulated, right? The first, to combine topics, the first school shooting where there's some AI-generated manifesto where the shooter talked to a chatbot or something, right? Um, you know, if there is detection of an attempt to commit bioterrorism that's successful or stopped that has an AI linkage, I think that will cause some type of moral panic or maybe there should be a panic. I don't know. Right. Maybe it's not wrong, but like that will change things. I would think a lot. Yeah. And for people who maybe heard what I just said and are like, what are you talking about? Like, that seems crazy. Like how many Americans are even aware that the chips and science act passed last year and that it cost a quarter of a trillion dollars and addressed all as many aspects of technology and the economy. Like most people are not aware because Lawmakers just got together and passed it. 
they felt like it was important. It happened outside of the limelight of the media and um, it didn't become partisan and it was just done. Anyway, rant over. I think we're going to leave it there, but obviously this is something we will come back to now that we've ripped the bandaid off and start and have started talking about AI on the politics podcast. For now, thank you, Kaylee, Nate, and Jeffrey. Thank you. Thanks, Galen. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room and also on video editing. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we will see you soon.